Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome to another exciting episode out of Carmina Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Carmina the Divine. Carmina the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. But before I do so, I thought it would be a great idea to introduce basic concept of Buddhism and the history of Buddhism so that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch it at the maximum value. So today is a very special day. Uh, seems like I say it's a special day all the time, but you know, today is something super special because uh, finally we get to learn about the Zen Buddhism, uh, Renzai Zen Buddhism. Uh, we've been talking about the uh, history of Buddhism uh, quite a bit time with the scholars, but you know, uh, it's my best intention to give opportunity for Buddhists to practitioners to answer some of the questions uh, about the Buddhism. So I'm very excited to have you, uh, Abed Made More. Welcome, welcome, Abed. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Beautiful, beautiful. So yes, 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 yes. Everybody knows about you, of course, but you know, in case. Uh, people who don't know anything about you, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Probably nobody knows about me, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, my name is Medo, and uh, I'm uh, living in Wisconsin. Uh, we have a Rinzai Zen monastery here near Madison, and uh, I serve as the abbot. So uh, basically, I'm ordained in the Zen tradition, and uh, we're doing a Zen practice here. at middle of Wisconsin, not Japan, but uh, we're trying the best to plant the roots of uh, authentic Zen here in the heartland, in the middle of the United States. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much for that. And uh, yes, we would like to uh, go right into the question. I know mm. this is a loaded question, and uh, you know, I'm sorry to ask you this question, but you know, uh, my show is about uh, asking a uh, loaded question. So <laughs> what is Zen for you? I know everybody has a different definition, but uh, please tell us uh, what is Zen for you? Yeah, everyone maybe has their own personal expression, but the uh, essential point of Zen is the same for everyone. And uh, of all the Buddhist traditions, uh, you, you know, all of the different schools which came out from India, China, and Japan, they're all pointing at the same realization or same experience and the same liberation. But uh, some of them will differ from each other depending on the path which they follow or the methods which they use. Uh, we could also say that some of them are very direct in the path. And the Zen, uh, to me, I would say is one of the most direct Buddhist paths. So it, essentially, Zen is the approach to Buddhist practice where we have to have the experience of enlightenment or wisdom or insight uh, experientially at the beginning of the training, rather than intellectually uh, and then uh, to approach it later, we should have it right at the beginning. And then all of the practice after that takes that uh, uh, insight as the basis of the practice. Uh, for that purpose, the, the Zen teacher is very important. The, the role of the Zen master is to help the student create the conditions to have that experience. But the, basically Zen is the, is the school in which we should understand what the Buddha experienced in our own body immediately at the beginning of the path. And then after that lifetime of practice, uh, how to clarify it, how to integrate it, how to embody it uh, with compassion for others. Of course, that is the same as the other Buddhist schools. Beautiful, beautiful. I know there are many different kinds of uh, uh, Buddhist schools, but uh, so uh, you are affiliated with the Renzai, Renzai school. So what is Renzai school? So what is unique about the Renzai school? Yeah, so in China, uh, of course, where uh, Zen came to Japan from there, there were different schools which arose and uh, they all have the same essential point, but uh, we could say they have a different energy or we say a kiai, the energetic vibration or the, the, the flavor could be different. Uh, Renzai school uh, comes from Rinzai, Rinzai Gigen, who died in uh, 868, 66, I believe. And we could say that that school is marked by very intense energetic vibration. 
Uh, it also very strongly stresses the physicality of the practice. So again, all Zen has that emphasis, but the Rinzai school, perhaps more strongly than some other schools, really stressing that the realization that comes out from Buddhism is a here in this body. Uh, it's not something just to be grasped conceptually. We have to physically be able to express it. So Rinzai himself, we, we read in the old writings and the record of Rinzai, a uh, very dynamic individual, uh, wild kind of energy, very intense kind of person. And the Rinzai school, as it came from China to Japan, uh, preserved that energy. And the Rinzai school came to Japan right around the Kamakura period beginning also. So that's the time, as you know, when the warrior culture started to have a strong influence more so in the Jap uh, Japanese history. So the meeting of that energy of those guys, the warriors, and the Rinzai teachers, somehow there was a commonality there. From that time onward, the Rinzai school in Japan was very strong. Beautiful, beautiful. Great. So uh, I heard about the uh, koan practice. This is a very unique <laughs> to uh, Rinzai school. Well, of course, at least from the literature. Uh, but you know, I would like to know uh, what koan school is. What is sudden awakening? So, uh, you know, all awakening is a sudden, but how or what methods could we use to turn around our own awareness and see clearly, as we say in Zen, what is my own nature? Uh, you know, as a human being, we believe we have some particular identity and we cling to that. But in the Zen teaching, in the Buddhist teaching, we know that uh, what we actually are, our, our true nature, which is not something we can always see clearly, but when we can experience it, we know it has no limitations at all. It's uh, truly something uh, boundless and free. Uh, it also is not limited, especially by this uh, idea of a solid self, which is separate from other phenomena. Huh? So koan is one of the methods developed in the Zen school very strongly to help us have that experience, that experience, what we call awakening, or in Japanese we say kensho, to see your own nature. Uh, koan method is very interesting. Um, really, any deep inquiry or question which uh, forces you to face that existential dilemma, we could say, we can call it koan. So a very simple koan, for example, is a question, who am I or what am I? How do I answer that one? We have a common answer. I'm a Meido, or this is my name, my identity, my history. But the Zen experience is much deeper than that. So the, the question itself becomes a focus in the meditation practice and allows us to break through the layers of our habitual uh, ignorance or delusion and have the experience which the Buddha had. And there's many koan. Uh, who am I is a very simple one, very profound, but very simple one. Uh, we have many other koan which are taken from the Zen records or the uh, records of the encounters between the Zen monks and the masters in ancient China and the Japan. And we could see from those episodes that are recorded how the enlightened mind of those great masters could function. And by contemplating or working on the koan, not the intellectually, but with the whole body, with the breath and the energy and the, the physical form, we could ourselves go into those situations and we could experience for ourselves the mind of the great masters like Rinzai or Joshua and so on. So the koan is a method really that allows us to touch the mind of the ancient masters and recognize for ourselves what they understood. It's a very ingenious method and the Rinzai school, uh, especially in Japan, developed it, uh, refined it to a very high degree. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. So uh, next question is, who is Asai? I heard uh, Asai is the founder, but you know, it seems like uh, uh, there's a, mo a lot more than just uh, uh, Asai in uh, this tradition. Please tell us. Yeah, well, Asai was a great monk, uh, Japanese monk, of course. And he was a Tendai Shu monk, the Tendai school. And uh, he went to China and he was one of the first, uh, the first to successfully bring back a Rinzai lineage from China and uh, start to plant it in Japan. So he's often called the founder of Rinzai Zen in Japan. And uh, the work he did was very important. He founded Kenenji, very famous monastery. Uh, 
he had a lot of struggle to have this new Zen school accepted by the other Buddhist schools. He did a lot of work. But when we talk about the, the real origin of Rinzai Zen or planting of Rinzai Zen in Japan, a little later, we have some other famous teachers, Daio Kokushi, Daito Kokushi, Kanzon again. These three masters, um, Daio was born maybe 15 or 20 years after Eisai died, so just a little after. They're the ones who planted the lineage which actually survived to today. And, and that's, those teachers are the ones we could say started to make a Zen distinctly Japanese character, not just imitating the Chinese school. So Eisai is very important, but there's many other teachers around that time. When, when we get to the time of Daito Kokushi and Muso Soseki, people like that, who founded the famous monasteries in Kyoto, for example, Daitokuchi and the Tenyuji, places like that. Uh, that's when we see the Zen is really flowering in Japan. So we respect Eisai, but uh, Eisai's lineage doesn't exist anymore. All the Zen masters today, also in the West, my own lineage, is coming from people like uh, Daio and Daito and the down through Hakuin in the 1700s and so on. So, so Eisai is a respected guy. <laughs> but uh, other people after that, they did a lot of work. Oh, wow. Well, I didn't really know that, you know. Uh, thank you for uh, teaching me as well. So, uh, yes, uh, next question is, so you told me about the, there's a, some practice that you guys do mm. uh, in Renzai school that uses statues, Buddhist statues. Yeah. yeah, I'm very curious since my documentary about the Buddhist sculptor of Japan. So, you know, please tell us, tell us. Yeah, and that's why I was very curious about your project also. It's very fascinating to me. So, from the, not from a scholarly standpoint, or not from the standpoint of studying the symbolism of the icon, you know, iconography and the different statues and the different mudras and what they're holding and those kind of things. From the standpoint of a practitioner, the Buddhist artwork is showing us something about our own bodies very concrete, very practical information about how we should practice. Uh, to give you some example, I, I think for example of a Neo statue, yeah? mm. and the Neo statue, not many statues, but the Neo we can see because they have no garment. It's usually the bare chest. Yeah? Mm. You can see that the, the belly, the hara, has a particular shape, very fullness. So we could say that's a statuary convention or artistic convention but from the standpoint of a practice it's showing us a particular way that we have to train our own breathing in zen to make the practice come alive uh, what we call the tanden soku the breathing which is focused on the energy center in the navel when we do that practice very interesting if we if we do that practice the body starts to change physically and eventually the the hara, the belly, looks like the statue. <laughs> so, you know, the navel points a particular direction and the fullness is there and it's quite interesting. So the statue for us, it has a kind of code. This is how you have to use your body. This is, this is the, it's showing us particular points about the physical side of Zen practice. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is the energetic vibration. Again, we use the word ki. Different statues have, uh, you know, feelings. Some are very intense and wrathful. Some are very peaceful, like a Shakyamuni uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. For us, the statues are giving us a particular vibration that we have to catch with the body. If we can do that, then it supercharges the practice. So, for example, if I see a statue of Fudomyo or Neo or those wrathful guys, they're showing me what kind of energy I need to do Zen practice. The Buddha statue, Shakka Nyorai, is the goal of the practice. But the Fudomyo is showing the energy we need to do the path of the practice, to, to cut through our own delusion. So if we know how to use the statues, I don't, not just looking with the eye and thinking about them conceptually, but if we know how to view them with the body, we can catch the vibration from the statue. 
I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a very nice Fudomyo statue in Chicago, in the Art Institute there. I think Kamakura period, so very nice. Yeah? It's not so big, you know, maybe, I don't know, this big. But if you stand in front of that statue and you look in the eyes of the statue and you open your body and you still your concentration and you know how to, to join with it, the statue will change your own vibration. You, you will feel completely transformed because of the energy coming out from the statue, which is originally from the artist, I believe. Yeah? So that's how we use those things. Uh, they're not just symbols. They're not just uh, uh, some object separate from us, but we're using them as mirrors to teach us about how to do the practice, how to do the breathing, how, how our own bodies should transform. We're also using them to catch the energy from them. Just like a, a shodo, a good piece of shodo, if it's in your room, good master artist, you might feel different if you spend time around it because a vibration is coming. So, so that's for, so for me, uh, for us, that's the more deep use of the statuary. I think most people, they view it as a symbolism. The statue represents compassion or this or this, or this mudra means this or this. But for us, it's more, uh, more practical, how we use it in the practice, how our own body should start to change. And also, how can I become a fudo? You know? <laughs> how can I catch that energy? not just look at it, how can I become, become, become. Energy of Fudomyo, compassion of Shakyamuni or Kanon. That is the, how we use those things. So I'm sorry for a long explanation. No, this is wonderful. Wow, this was such an eye-opening experience. So I didn't know that you know, I, we can actually see the statues in this way. I'm very mm. thrilled that you know, I had you today. I'm sure like a lot of people had no idea. Hmm. Great, great. Yeah. Awesome. Great Go. statue, you, you can feel it. Great statue, it, it transforms your mind, it transforms your body. And that's why for us it's so useful, so, such a useful tool for practice to have on the Butsudan that kind of wonderful art because it's showing us our own potential. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm blown away, so I don't know what to do with it anymore. But uh, I think uh, it's a good segment to uh, end this show. Uh, but you know, before uh, you know, we end this show, I would like to ask you like, uh, what kind of activity you do? And uh, I heard like uh, you uh, published a book and stuff. So you know, how can we know more about you? Please tell us. <laughs> well, of course. Uh... We have the monastery here in Wisconsin, uh, which is uh, new. We just finished the building this year. So we're in the middle of our first year of a true monastic Zen training. If anyone would like to know about that, they can go to the website, which is korinji.org, K-O-R-I-N-J-I.org. And uh, yeah, I was fortunate that uh, Shambhala Publications uh, printed a book, which I wrote, which is called The Rinzai Zen Way, A Guide to practice and it's meant for beginners uh, it's meant to give a exposure to the Rinzai approach to Zen in the West most of the books and most of the Zen activity has been from the perspective of a Soto school different school so this is a Rinzai school uh, I wrote this book to try to give people some idea of how we practice so I hope it's useful and uh, anyone can check it out uh, on uh, Amazon or any place they like Beautiful, beautiful. So if you guys think this information is useful, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and like me on my Facebook, because that's how we do it in the 21st century. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you more so much. So thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I'll talk to you soon. I appreciate it.